Good morning again. Um, welcome all to this, uh, for, uh, f to this uh, forum and to the students and also to all the guests. I hope certainly uh, you, you will enjoy um, our presentation, the presentation before and also uh, the next couple of days uh, you'll uh, stay here. And um, it is really a great good idea to talk about this uh, great power politics to begin to kick off this uh, seminar. Uh, the, the nature of the international relationship certainly uh, is first, first and foremost uh, focused on the great powers because the great powers uh, define the terms in international relations and, and then um, small, mediocre states would have to adjust their policy, uh, make their calculations depending on what the great powers do. So, I think it really is a good idea um, to, to start this discussion uh, with a look at the rebirth of great power politics. So I, um, I am asked here to share my insights on the, the nature of U.S.-China relations. And um, we are asked also uh, to put forward some provocative calls to challenge um, not just our guests here, but to the students as well. Uh, because you have gone through a whole year of study. Uh, it really is a time you bring your thoughts to bear and share with our guests in our seminar. So uh, I will try to be uh, provocative in um, putting forward my insight on the nature of U.S.-China relationship and many of the related issues. And hopefully uh, will be enough to generate some good discussions uh, in the seminars to follow. Um, when we talk about the, <laughs> the rebirth of great power politics, this one, there you go, oh. one more, there you go. Um, we look at the rebirth of great power politics and nowhere is more apparent in the Asia Pacific area. And the rebirth of this great power politics center has in many years in its making, as you, most of you have known that. Since the final decades of the last century, there is this geostrategic shift of uh, power center from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And to this day, and this shifting is still going on, it's still taking place. And with the changes taking place in this area and from elsewhere to this huge region, the best way to characterize the Asia-Pacific region is to look at this region in transition. There are some very strong undercurrents in this Pacific region. It's mixed current, currents. On the one hand, there is a nation, there is a region-wide drive for peace and development. Most of the Asian states are all in a hurry to develop their countries, all want peace and economic development. However, there is, on the other hand, many unsettled territorial disputes in this area. Many of them are now being pulled back by those uh, very heated, very controversial territorial disputes. So the two currents somehow pull against each other or push against each other. And then on top of these undercurrents is the United States-China relationship. The United States and China has a precarious relationship ever since the founding of the People's Republic in 1949. And then since 1978, when China embarked on its modernization mission, U.S.-China relationship has taken on new significance. With the rise of China subsequently, this significance get a lot more intensified. Okay? So, for the rest of the 10 minutes, I'm going to walk you over the, the significant part of this U.S.-China relationship, and then hopefully this U.S.-China relationship will help you to see the other problems, peace and development, and territorial dispute in this vast region. In order to understand the nature of U.S.-China relationship, 
I think I need to give you a little dose of theory. Some of you may have known this. Many students have taken my lectures, uh, have exposed to this. Uh, let me go over this. To use a theory called a power transition to describe the United States-China relationship. What this relationship, this power transition, is not just about the power changes between the United States and China. It is all about international system. It is about the future of international relationship, very much dependent on how this relationship changed between the United States and China. Now, to think about an international system, you look at the pyramid. It is a construct of an international system. Great powers have the tendency to get together to form an international system in political, security, economic senses. They develop institutions, use their values, and establish orders. They derive interest from, the, from this system and expect everyone else to follow the rules. And this chart also says something about peace and a war. As the theory goes that if the great powers can maintain order in this international system, even though quite a few of them in a shaded area are not happy, okay, um, if those are small powers like a terrorist or middle yoga powers like North Korea and, and Iran, they can make trouble for the system, they can make our life miserable, but they cannot upset and overthrow the system. As long as the great powers have firm control of this international system and maintain the order, this system is free of great power wars. Hence, peace. It doesn't mean good peace, okay? It just, there is no big power war because when great powers fight, everybody suffer. Well, trouble starts if one or several great powers in that shady area among the great powers, the backward one, started to experience economic development and become more powerful. So the first part of the power transition is the internal development in the great power, and then this development have external impact. One of the great impact is a rising power initially unhappy with the system, thinking the system work against its interest. With newfound power, would typically try to do something to alter these international rules and institutions. As soon as the rising power starts to do that, it brings itself to confront the other great powers and eventually the most powerful nation at the top. And if they cannot come to terms with this demand and changes, they go to the battlefield throughout history. That's what the Thucydides is first made his comment. Okay. Um, the threat of changing this international order, bring these great powers to the battlefield and they settle the differences in battlegrounds. Now, with China's rising, I would submit that China is undisputed container in this system. I can dismiss Russia. Russia, its predecessor, tried to challenge this international system, but failed. Russia will become a great power again, but it doesn't have anything variable to offer the international system. Uh, Japan and Germany, they've been defeated. They tried, they defeated, and now they are part of the United States democratic camp. Um, no one else would be able to challenge this. Only China has the capacity and could have the ambition as a result of its rising power to offer something and they believe different from what we know as the international system. Now, while many scholars, academic analysts, including the Chinese, are still debating whether the, the power transition theory is applicable to China, many are talking about Avoiding the Thucydides trap, I submit to you that the power transition between China and the United States is real. It is affecting international and regional orders, and it has entered already into the second stage, the first of which is the first 30 years, starting from China's economic reform, and could be nicely cut off in uh, 2008. And at the second stage, when China narrow its national power gap with the United States, there are some very typical behavior will take place here. One is the setting great power will be more uneasy and unconcerned with the rising power. 
and may even in history preempt the rising power. And the rising power will become more assertive and become uncompromising. Well, certainly the United States is uneasy and has taken this rebalanced approach towards the Asia Pacific. Although senior officials have all come out to deny it is about China, but who else if not about China, right? The whole rebalance is about the rise of China. The United States need to deal with it. Six years into having this rebalance, an evaluation uh, could be said that the United States have done the right thing to turn to Asia Pacific because it's so important. It's the powerhouses of this unfolding 21st century. But I submit that the administration has not done a good job. Having a good thing to do doesn't mean you can do it right. Okay? And I think that, um, among many other things, we are now running the risk of letting the tail wag the American dog. Okay? I can come to more about it when we come to the uh, question and answer period. Now, another game changer is on China's part. And earlier uh, last year, China has a new president, and the president started to have an assertive diplomacy in the foreign policy. And in June of last year, he came to the United States and had a meeting with President Obama. And China, for the first time, put forward a call of great power, model of great power politics, among which he asked the United States to respect China's core interest, and also mutual respect as well. But there are many problems because the United States have never looked eye to eye with China over China's so-called core interest. Now, China happens to be the most, the, the oldest and most continuous civilization and nation in the world. But it is a young nation. It has many nation building businesses, unfinished. And you look around in the Pacific, all around China, there are so many unsettled issues. When China, after six decades, settle its internal security, and now turns outward to settle, consolidate its maritime interest. It run into the United States. It run into its neighbors. So that has many of these conflicts now taking place. The United States, unfortunately, is involved, deeply involved in every piece of it. As we are moving, as we are talking today, you have seen many things taking place between China and Japan, between China and Philippines, and China and Vietnam. The United States is behind every one of those. And as the United States taking more and more a more assertive position against China, I will submit also, eventually, all those conflicts in the Western Pacific will be between the United States and China. Very difficult. So, to conclude. Good, thanks. Um, <laughs> I know I have to give many details. So um, when, when we come to the q and I hope you ask questions so that I have a chance to uh, re-engage you with that. Quickly go through, hope you understand the nature of the United States-China relationship. And as the leaders on the two sides talk about how this Pacific Ocean should be big enough for these two nations to uh, coexist, um, it may not be because the conflict of interest between these two, and the uncompromising positions. Secretary Hegel was in Singapore just this last weekend. He put China on notice. When some nations try to do something to challenge the fundamental, the fundamental order and value of the international and regional system, the United States would not look the other way. He was putting in that, but China was in U.S. perspective, challenging the United States-led international regional, regional system. The United States would not look the other way. And the China certainly fought back. And it was a heated debate between the two in the Shangri-La uh, Defense Minister's meeting. So I conclude with the question, is the Pacific Ocean big enough? It may not be. Thank you very much. <laughs>